Hi, this is Joe, uh, prep agent. Today we're going over a lesson with my new friend, Maria. Hi, Maria. Hi. So we're trying to get Maria past the real estate exam like everybody else. And today we're going over some appraisal. Some of you guys call it valuation market analysis. So we had a little bit of a tough time with that in our last exam, right, Maria? Yes, I did. Okay, no worries. We're going to get you past and everything's going to be fantastic. You trust me? Yes, I do. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, so let's start with this. Do you know exactly what an appraisal is? Um, no, not really, actually, honestly. Well, let's okay, let's think about it. So you've heard the word appraisal before, right? Yes. What comes to mind when you hear the word appraisal? Value of a property. That's okay. what I think of. Okay, you just think value of a property. Who decides that value of the property? An appraiser. So here's where I'm going with this. I want you to remember, first and foremost, an appraiser is neutral. It's supposed to be an unbiased, objective opinion value. Because obviously if he was on the side of the lender or the seller or all that, it could be a conflict of interest. Because many of those fees, whether it's the commission on the house or the amount, the loan amount, is contingent upon what the appraiser decides as the price of the property. Okay. So let me ask another question here. When you think of value, what's what's value? I mean, what's something you really like in your life? What do you like? What do you enjoy buying? Clothes. Clothes. Okay. So a pair of shoes, right? You like a new pair yep. of shoes? Yep. How much is a pair of shoes that you like? It depends. On what? On the brand or what it looks like or... Okay, so related to houses, you'll say like the location, the color house, the size. How right. do they decide the price? So when a brand comes out with a new pair of shoes, how do they come up with the price of that uh, pair of shoes? Uh, I think they would compare it to other shoes. So if it's selling a lot, then they would base the value of the shoe on that. So basically, if people are buying it a lot, right, the price goes up. Yes. That is the essential definition of value. Everything you described, I want you to relate it to houses. Sometimes people think of real estate as a different entity. It's not. You deal with this stuff every day when you go buy something you like, like a pair of shoes. Uh -huh. It's the most likely price that a probable buyer will pay for a property in an open market of sale. So when you look at those shoes, it doesn't matter if those shoes are hideous or not. If everybody wants them, the price goes up. And you mentioned a brand, people may like that brand. So the price of the shoes go up. The value goes up. And the value is whatever a willing and able buyer will pay for it. Okay, so let's start there. Everything's going to revolve from there. Sound good? Yes. Okay. All right, there's three basic appraisal approaches that we should really understand um, when you look at the price of properties. Do you see them there? Yes. Okay, read them off for me. Market data approach, income approach, and cost approach. Okay, let me ask you something. When you gave that example of the shoes, which is a great example, um, I love that example because it really puts into real life terms for people. Uh -huh. What approach did you use? Um, so I have a, yeah. Market data, I would think. Excellent, perfect. That's the right answer. And what about when you said when I asked you what was the value of those shoes? What did you say when you were like, well, the value of the shoes is turned because da 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 You said something that was very spot on. It just depends on how much it's sold or how, many, how, how much people like it. Right, and how much people are paying for similar shoes in the right. area. Right. Okay, so that's the market data approach. Okay, we're going to go over that one first. So we'll get to the income approach and cost approach a little bit later. Okay, but market data approach is basically just looking at comparisons in the market. Okay? Okay. Easy one. And so I want you to pass the appraisal, no problem. It's a very easy one to get past because it's very easy to connect visual images with it. Whereas other parts of your exam, like finance, it's kind of difficult to attach tangible v images in your mind. Whereas the appraisal, really try and connect real life images to help you understand the concepts. Right. All right. So market data. You like that little graphic? That was fancy, right? 
<laughs> learned that at the Apple Store. Okay. <laughs> I know, very exciting. Okay, so we got the market data sales comparison approach. Okay, how much is that home in the middle worth? Um, well, I messed up my graphic. <laughs> I just gave the answer. Okay. <laughs> 400 grand, right? Okay. Sorry, I goofed on that one. Okay, what, okay. what I was getting at here is if you have 400, 400, the middle one, if it's a similar house, is also $400,000. Okay. Right. Similar situation with your shoes. All right? So we're just looking at comparison in the open market. So why do I have this picture? What, is, what are you looking at here? A shrimp. Not just any shrimp. Jumbo shrimp. Do you know what a jumbo shrimp is? It's a large yep. shrimp. Right. Why do I love that example? Because the definition is right there in the name. Jumbo shrimp. There's not some fancy word for it. It is what it is. Kind of like with a market data sales comparison approach. You're comparing other sales in the market. Basically what I'm trying to get you to do is not overcomplicate things. Uh-huh. You know, sometimes it's right there in the name, like the jumbo shrimp. Can't really tell it's a jumbo shrimp in this image because there's no other shrimps compared to. I got to work on that. But <laughs> trust me, it's an enormous shrimp. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so there it is. Comparing sales in the market, market data approach or sales comparison. It's one and the same. Market data approach, sales comparison. Okay? Okay. How are we doing so far? Great. Oh, look, shoes. Perfect. Okay. Um, how much is that third? Ah, damn it. I got to get this. How much is, okay, if I have $40 here, how much are the other shoes going to be worth? 40 40 Okay. I use that shoe example. You used it as well. So why can't I use it? Right? It's a perfect example. It's just comparing other things in the market. This may start to sound redundant, but if you remember this concept, it's really going to help you get past the exam. All right, I just had a pool. Why? What what changed right now? The value would change. The value. It's other houses don't have it. And this is the flaw with this approach, which is why I have my friend with the question marks there. It's my high-end animation that I drew myself. <laughs> um, okay, so why is this a flaw with the market data approach? How did that pool just kind of totally set things off kilter? Because it's, you can't really compare to other properties. Right. So here I have all the properties the same. Going back to my example, 40 grand, 40 grand, 40 grand. Excuse me, 500 grand across the board, right? Right. We had our pool. Everything changes. Because it's hard to tell exactly how much that pool added value or took away value. Right. I mean, you use your example of your shoes. If you had three pairs of shoes, they're all the same. And then you put something simple, like red laces in one of them. It totally throws things off. Because do people like the red laces? Do they not like the red laces? Is that color going to add value? Is it going to take away value? Maybe people don't like laces at all. It seems like something very small and simple. But you don't know how the market's going to respond. Right. So it makes it a little more difficult. So the flaw with the market data approach is these intangibles. On your exam, you may actually see the example of a pool, just FYI. Okay. Okay, principle of substitution. Going back to my jumbo shrimp, it's just how much would it cost to substitute one for another? All right, Maria, um, let's put you on the spot here. Ready? Yes. First question of the day. Are you nervous? No. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, what do you think? A. Dun, 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 dun. Awesome. Good. And that's that example of that pool we just went over. Mm hmm. All right, perfect. Another one. D? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Can I give you a little advice for your exam? Yeah. You studied, correct? Yes. 
if you do not recognize something on the exam, do not circle it. <laughs> All right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people get nervous on their exam. And I understand why. You know, it's a stressful thing. Your career is based upon it. So it's a high anxiety moment for you. And it creates insecurity. And when you're studying, you go over a lot of things. You see something on your exam and you start to ask yourself, well, that doesn't look familiar, but it looks important. Maybe I just didn't study enough. Maybe I didn't see it. Hmm, maybe I, what? Oh, no, I'm scared. I should probably circle. And you second guess yourself. Did that happen on your exam when you didn't pass last time? Yeah, I think like every question. Right. Here's what you need, what I want you to think about, okay? You studied the correct information. You didn't study wrong information. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you see something like principle of substitution, you may be like, I don't know what that is, but I remember I read about it somewhere and it was, it was in my book. So therefore, it's definitely answer to something. And here it is in front of me. Therefore, I totally want to circle it. And there you go. And chances are you'll be correct. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Because if you've never heard of it, it was not in any of your definitions, in your textbooks, in your practice questions, anything else. And therefore, you should not be circling it. Okay. Okay? Just trust me on that one. If something <laughs> looks totally strange to you, don't circle it. Okay. Okay. So next we have the capitalization income approach. Um... You go to the you go buy your shoes at the store, right? We go back to that that example. Right. How much is the the store worth? Forget the shoes, the actual store. Um, I'm not sure. Right. How would you find out? Uh, <laughs> ask the store, I guess. I don't know. So let's talk from a appraiser perspective. Okay. Um. Would comparables work for the store? So if you looked at the shoe store, right, and next to that they had the hat store or whatever you want to call it, food, whatever it is you like, you know, right, right, right next to the shoe store. Um, do they have the same value? No. But wait a minute. They're the same size. They're right next to each other. They both are white uh, buildings in the same area. Why aren't they the same uh, price? Because it depends on how much one is selling more than the other, right? So you're it, saying the income the store brings is relevant? Yes. So would you call that the income approach? Yeah. <laughs> Jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> if you catch my drift. So one thing I'm hearing with you, and I hope people watching this um, take this in as well, you know more than you think. It's just sometimes I feel like with people in your situation, a lot of people do this. I did this myself. You overcomplicate it a little bit. And when you actually talk through it, the answer is right there in front of you. And hopefully knowing that gives you a little more confidence in what you're doing. Um, because when you see it, it converts income into value. If that shoe store is selling a ton of shoes, that building's going to have more value. Right. So the capitalization income approach takes that income and converts to value. Simply said, if a property's worth a hundred grand and it's bringing in millions of dollars in sales, you'll pay more than a hundred grand for it. Correct? Hey. If it's not selling anything, you're probably not going to pay a hundred grand for it. The value is related to the income. Got it. So where does this come in? A shopping center. Okay. So whenever there's income coming, you want that capitalization income approach. The formula, how they do it, is a little more tricky, which I don't think we're going to get into today. But that's basically it right there. Okay. And hopefully understanding things like this, when you see different types of property, they'll say, hey, what type of property is the income approach most applicable for? You'll circle shopping center instead of like a residential home. Okay. Got it. Okay. Cap rate is directly related to risk. Okay. Okay. A post office would have a lower cap rate because it's lower risk. Okay, so you actually like the lower cap rate. It's a more steady income. A hardware store has a higher cap rate, it's higher risk. 
Why do you use these examples? Because they tend to use these examples on the exam. Post office and hardware store. Some people will say they like the higher risk because it also means more potential income. Um, but debate that with people after you pass. Right now, as you're getting ready for the exam, low risk is really good. Okay. So does that make sense? Like, so a post office is lower risk because, you know, there are always going to be people getting stamps. I mean, obviously, it's less people, more people, but generally, it's a low risk building in lieu of income. Okay. You're right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. okay. If you have any questions, ask me, okay? So by lower risk, um, you mean, does that mean like running out of business fast? Is I don't right. understand the lower risk. No, no, risk. you said it perfectly. There's less chance it'll go out of business. The post office will be here next week, the week after, the week after that. Okay, that makes sense now. Okay, I get it. Yeah, whereas that hardware store could go out of business. And once again, people watching this will say, but I think post offices are becoming dated. It's like, oh, you know, screw off. You know, wait till after you pass the debate all this stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, this is why our online webinar is so great. Everybody listening don't have to deal with that annoying person in the front of the room, raise their hand saying, I know, I know better. Well, great. Now they can just comment at the bottom of the YouTube video. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. By the way, people still comment on the bottom of the video. I, I will still respond. I'll just make fun of you in private. <laughs> okay, here we go. An appraiser would use which of the following approaches in a shopping center? B. Okay, you are correct, but let me ask you this for a second. Which one of those have you heard of? So let's take out the question. Don't even look at the question. Okay. If you just looked at A, B, and C, okay, here, I'm going to do something here for one second. I'm going to, okay. Let's look at this for a second. Going back to my theory, which one of these do you recognize? Or let me go reverse. Which one of these do you not recognize? Um, I kind of recognize all of them. Well, I guess A, but then I would compare A to D. Right. So based on what we've gone over today, which one of these words have I not used yet? C. Excellent. So right there, when you're taking your exam, now there is times we'll go over this in future lessons, but for what we've done today, I've not said the word replacement yet. So let's say today was the only studying you've done, just what we've done in this past, whatever it's been, 20 minutes-ish, uh -huh. you would say, I'm eliminating C right now. Right. If you were a little nervous or a little insecure, you might say, gosh, that looks, that, looks, that looks like a reasonable thing. That seems like a very real estate-y word. I think I'll circle it. It might be correct. Okay? okay? But I want you to say I've never seen it. Boom. A and D, we've gone over. That was the thing with the shoes and the comparison properties to each other. Right. So immediately you could eliminate it to three options. And then you correctly came up with the capitalization approach. Right. So, so hopefully what I'm doing for you here and for people watching is getting some test taking skills going of elimination. I mean, the first step, there's a lot of test taking skills we'll go over in future webinars, but this is the first one I want you to get down. Eliminate things you don't understand. Okay. Or excuse me, they've never seen before. Okay. Now I said you haven't heard of the replacement approach. Well, you have now. So now that theory on the last question won't work anymore because now you've seen this approach. So I'm going to ask you a question. How or what approach do you use for residential properties? Market data. Excellent. Good. What kind of properties are those? Those are like houses, correct? Right. What approach do you use for a shopping center? Income approach or cap. Good. What do you need in order to use the market data approach effectively? Uh, other properties com to compare it to. Excellent. What do you need in order to use the income approach effectively? Well, it depends on how well the business itself is going. 
What type of buildings do not have comparisons and do not bring in an income? Churches. Okay. Schools. Good. Um. You got the right idea. Police stations, <laughs> schools, libraries. Right. Basically, public service buildings. I mean, there may be a few other examples, but generally is what we're talking about. Buildings that do not bring in income, do not have comparables. Now what do you do? I mean, so there's nothing. So basically, when you look at, let's say, a library. How many libraries are in your town? About one. One. So most communities have one library per town, one police station, one school. Meaning there's no comparables to compare it to. So how would you find the lot, the value of that library? You can't compare it. Right. So would you just come up with your own price? It's a good question. So essentially what you have to do is figure out how much it would cost to, well, rebuild it. Okay. There's other factors you could take in, but at the core of it, we're talking about is the cost replacement approach. Now, listen to what I say here. It's how much would it cost to replace it brand new? What's the inherent flaw with that? You don't have anything else to compare it to, so... Well, no, with this, if I'm trying to... Find the value by how much it would cost to replace it brand new. Hmm. Um, no. When was your library built in your town? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm getting at is most libraries are not brand new. That's the problem with it. The cost approach sets the upper limits of value. Because you're looking at the value to replace something that's brand new, that's far from brand new. Especially the buildings we're talking about, the library, the schools, the police stations. Usually these, these are very often built when the town was originally built. Okay. So this approach is highly flawed. Okay, And the older it gets, the more flawed it gets because you have more depreciation to factor in. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Because you have to replace it with the same, uh, the building that has the same utility. You know, same turnstiles, same water, same everything. But you're replacing everything brand new. Okay. So if you were praising an old building, it's how tough. would you it's do tough. that? It's very difficult. I mean, professional appraisers have methods they use. But if there's no comparisons, no income, and it's a really old building, it's very difficult. Okay. Okay. Before you say anything, I want you to look at these answers and tell me which one you are like, what's that all about? I've never seen that before. That's ridiculous. D. <laughs> Good. So do not circle D. Okay? okay. So right off the bat, you're like, I don't even know if that's English. I don't even know what's going on there. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. now, what, which one would you use? B. Okay. Excellent. Good. All right. And that you use your judgment. These houses are sold a lot. Income properties are sold all the time. So you would kind of do a little analysis saying, well, I think you know, old buildings, cost replacement approach, those aren't sold very often. My next piece of advice for you, don't overthink things. Are you a thinker? Yes. Stop it. <laughs> All right? Intelligence is way overrated. Just let me, let me just tell you that. Hey, have you ever seen real estate agents that are like really stupid and you're just like, how the hell did that person get their license? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how. They took my webinars, right? And they, they passed. That's how they're, they're all doing it. You're welcome. I'm responsible for all the stupid agents in the country. Ta-da. <laughs> okay. You know what they do? They don't overthink. You're very smart. Well, stop being smart. It, I told you, it's way overrated and it's just hurting you. Okay, so when you sit there and analyze it and think about it, what am I getting at here? Property is seldom sold. Will be appraised by which of the following? You're just like, well, 
I've seen a house that hasn't sold very often, and da da da. I've seen income properties. That mall has been there forever. It doesn't sell very often. You're <laughs> overthinking it, right? And, and is that something that sounds like you would do? Yes. I mean, I mean, I know the library has, but I mean that 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 shoe store. It's been around since I was born. So I don't know what they're talking about, you know. So I hear people do it all the time. Very smart people. Save the thinking for after you pass. Right now, circle the correct thing, get your license, give me a high five, and rock out. All right? That's all we're doing right now. Okay. And join all the other stupid people who have their license. Okay. <laughs> the difference is the smart people eventually make money with the license. The stupid people get their license, and then they're just good to go. Right. Okay. So I think we're good right here for right now. Um... My little end tip, keep it simple, keep it concise, okay? And, you know, you've been using my website, and I also have my prep agent website, so you can look there. But how are we doing for today? What do you think? Great. I'm good. I mean, there's still more we could go over, but maybe we could take that little bit in and see how we do it there. Has this okay. Been, has this been helpful for you? Yes, very helpful. Thank you. All right, great. And this is Joe, prepagent.com. And I'll talk to everybody soon.